Hello everyone, my name is Alex Tran. I am the Northern California Architectural Sales Consultant for BMD um, in the Millwork Division representing Marvin. And today I have with me Maria Danielides from Morrow Studio. Maria, great to have you on. Thank you, Alex, good to be joining you. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, I guess I'm going almost on 25 years in architecture now, but I spent the first 17 years working for a firm here in San Francisco. We actually uh, started out, it was a, an office in Pittsburgh, and um, the, a project brought us out here to the West Coast um, in 1999, and I've stayed ever since. So um, about five and a half years ago, I left that firm to uh, try something different, and it was a bit of an ac accidental entrepreneurship. So I now work for myself and have been, um, and it's uh, transitioned from mainly commercial, this commercial sector to residential work now, um, ironically. So here in the Bay Area, I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to work with some great clients and through referral, um, but it definitely has been transitioning from commercial to residential. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and we really appreciate all your collaboration at BMD, so thank you very much, Maria. Um, and I'll just kind of get right into it today. So what we're discussing today is really remodels and different trends we're seeing in the marketplace. So how have things like shelter in place impacted the motivation to remodel? You know, that's a great question, and I, I think it's been, um, there have been basically two responses from my clients in what I would call a kind of precarious time, and I should probably preface this in the sense that the projects I've been working on more recently are for folks who are in early retirement or newly retired, uh, going into retirement, so they're planning on remodeling their home to kind of take them into the next phase of their life. Then there's um, sometimes a young couple with a growing family and they might have their home for the first time and it's, you know, San Francisco or in the, in the peninsula of the Bay Area and they are looking to remodel that would respond to their growing family. And then thirdly, I would have um, folks who are also sort of independent homeowners and they either are thinking of making their house a home for longer term. So it might be more of a long-term projection and a bigger renovation to um, take them into you know, a decade or more. Um, and so I've been, it's a very, very limited or narrow focus of clientele, I should preface that. So, um, so those individuals that I've been working with in the last year now that we're coming upon almost a year for the shelter in place has been more twofold they're either they're either somewhat um nervous and have a high level of uncertainty or anxiety so they may actually defer what they had planned um i've had few individuals who had to put their project on hold but then there are other folks who, because they're working from home, because this, the kids are working or schooling from home, um, or they find themselves now just more of a heightened awareness of their surroundings. And so their home, which seemed relatively fine for the hours that they spent on a normal work day or weekends and whatnot, has become more, um, they, they just have a heightened awareness of deficiencies or there might be things like disrepair that is really becoming more of a front burner um, issue for them. And that could be any number of things, temperature control, noise mitigation, um, separation, a quiet space. Um, sometimes it's also just recognizing a dysfunctional kitchen because they're no longer eating out or they're finding themselves needing to have um, a lot more space for that kind of activity than ever before. And those individuals are more motivated, but they also have the means to think about those things, meaning that they may have a, um, money 
that they feel they can tap into to pursue those goals. And and again, I want to maybe preface that it's a small, smaller group of people who have the means to think about those things under the circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I can tell you from personal experience, being home and not being on the road or being on a plane or being in Minnesota, I definitely saw things at home and I'm like, well, that's not working. We're going to have to change that or that patch of dying grass in the backyard is going to have to get <laughs> sorted out for summertime. So absolutely. Now, any specific changes in architecture um, that you see? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I would call them changes per se. I just think it's more about um, implementing um, things like privacy or noise control, letting in light, good lighting in general. Maybe it's artificial as well as natural light. Um, uh, things such as um, ventilation and views or just comfort level in in where you know where you are whether it's working or you know schooling the kids it's it's again um i think bringing those elements that are not new ideas per se but they're more of what i feel are more appreciated as best practices in architecture and i i sense that clients are starting to appreciate suggestions that maybe they didn't think of before as being as critical but now they're starting to be more aware of it so i think that's again maybe just more of implementing what are what i would call our best practices um and then there's certainly for certain um individuals or or clients they're focusing on spaces that maybe they don't have right now such as you know, getting that proper game room to escape with the family, or maybe they do need a glorified um, office space in their home because if they're in tech, they may actually feel like they're going to be working from home forever because that seems to be a trend in their workplace. But um, I, I do see that um, there's a focus on sometimes spaces in their homes that are additive in nature or modified relative to those things that I mentioned before, which is height of a heightened awareness of, of deficiencies or, mm -hmm. um, or a lack thereof. So, um, and then I also would find that outdoor spaces, landscape improvements, certainly if they've got a backyard, um, there I see some, an uptick in, in outdoor improvements. Um, I'm sure it's because they, wanted to take advantage even more so being outdoors and gather outdoors in their backyard um, as well as get, you know, um, the kids, you know, being outside versus under normal circumstances, maybe at the playground, what have you. But that's led to, you know, an, an uptick outdoor kitchens, things like that um, have perhaps grown in some popularity. But then again, they're not new ideas, but they definitely have become more of an incentive. Mm. Yeah, understood. Now with the current climate and I mean, real estate wise, are we have, we're at a record low, I believe, interest rates. Um, do you think there's kind of a rush to remodel? People are refinancing and putting money back into their homes? That's a great question. I haven't had a lot of real specific examples of insight into that, but I'm going to make some some guesses perhaps or some impressions share some impressions on that i i think there's been not necessarily going back to the first kind of question about whether they're motivated to remodel some people are actually feeling like um they're not in a rush to remodel they may be considering it but they're also living in you don't want to live in place during a big remodel so they're considering like where they would be when all this work might be taking place. So I think that kind of doesn't necessarily rush them into anything, but um, I, I would suspect that the low interest rates are an incentive um, for sure if there's construction loans or things of that nature. And then um, um, I, 
I think related to interest rates, I might even call out the fact that I've been seeing more first time home buyers or homeowners. Um, they're trying to get into the market for the first time because of those low interest rates. So they're shopping around in the Bay Area for for a home or to buy a home. And I, I have been seeing more people approach me in that capacity um, as well. And so uh, what they're finding, though, is that they most likely are looking at something that may have fallen into disrepair or may need some upgrades. So they definitely um, need to factor that into their budget. Mm -hmm. Now, something I've seen as kind of a trend since the shelter in place was uh, an increase of um, accessory dwelling units, ADU projects and within the Bay Area. Have you had any experience with that? I, I have, are you, are you, but you're seeing an increase during the last year? Mm -hmm. Okay, so accessory dwelling units became more popular prior to COVID, um, in this, and especially in the Bay Area, because there was an incentive because of our housing crisis, for one, um, that our own, not to get into the weeds too much, but our own planning department and our own um, building and planning departments here in the city took initiative to um, promote accessory dwelling units where they may not necessarily have been permitted for zoning beforehand. Mm -hmm. So there was some incentives and prototypes of um, to to get folks thinking about that or legalizing something that may have been illegal before, whether it was an extra in law or you know um, a, a space that that was an apartment but just needed to have um, proper modifications done um, to bring it up to code. So. I was doing those maybe five years ago, actually, and seeing that um, that um, trend, I guess we can call it, basically through folks, though, who um, have a very conducive property to undertake that um, as an option because it's not it's not an easy thing. It shouldn't be underestimated that it does take a quite a bit of planning and and um, design execution to to make those those accessory dwelling units work. And so I did do uh, a, like a couple of those types of projects here in San Francisco in the la within the last five years. And and it was mainly also because folks really find the incentive to have passive income. But I think it probably also at times had a sense of being multi-generational in nature so that I do get clients who also um, want to think of it as initially maybe a, an extra guest room or, or space of that nature for, um, you know, for friends and family to visit, but then it can be something that they want to build in so that it legally is um, a, an accessory dwelling unit and not just a guest room so that they have a choice to move forward in in renting it, um, or perhaps somewhere down the road, mom or dad come back and live with them, or and want their own separate space. Or I could also see the adult child coming back from home, you know, back to home from college or between jobs or what have you. And that also is a reality for. Um, I think probably a lot of people in the last, not just COVID, but probably in the last you know, 10, 15 years since the recession even of 2008. So, so there's good long-term strategy strategies related to those ADUs, um, but they're not simple by any means and, you know, need proper planning and, um, and, and they're not inexpensive, especially in the Bay Area. And so it is a long term investment. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your input for mm -hmm. our remodeling and trends webinar. So thank you very much for your time. For sure. Maria, I will speak to you soon. Have a wonderful day. For sure. Thank you so much, Alex. Talk to you later. I'm here with Andrea Holmes with Thermatrue Doors. She's the national account manager for Thermatrue. Welcome, Andrea. Appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us. Thank you for having me.
So, so give us a little background about yourself. Um, tell, tell us who you are, what, what you do for Thermatree. Yeah, so I'm a national accounts manager, um, really focused on the remodeling and uh, retail channels and uh, live in Nashville, Tennessee um, and have for 20 years and uh, have also been in the industry for about 17 years. So uh, been, been through a few things and uh, seen some ups and downs, definitely. Yeah, and this is obviously a unique time for all of us right now, and I know you're seeing a lot of that. But but let's just jump in right away and 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 just talk about you know the remodeling and the trends that are going on there. How do you see the trends going in the remodeling? Uh, is it do you see it stronger now um, because of COVID in the resulting economy? You know that was always my fear is is stepping into this year, uh, knowing what's coming and thinking, wow, you know things. Things are really going to lock down. It's going to be a tight year for us, but you know we saw it a little differently. What what do you what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we we have definitely seen strong demand um, and actually stronger than pre COVID. Um, you know, I think with people being at home more, um, there's definitely been more DIY projects, um, and then a growing number of do it for me projects as well. Um, some of the research that we've seen has um, said that that people pulled forward projects, maybe that they were planning for a year or two from now. Uh, maybe they had been saving for that, um, be, but because they did have some money in savings, also had the time um, and the ability to do it, that they just decided now was the time. So um, right. the forecast really, what we're seeing though, is that there's likely to be more do it for me um, because a lot of those uh, DIY projects are now done. So, um, you know, that may be really for the near term what we see more of. Right, right. Very interesting. And obviously, you know, entries doors are a, are a big part of that. You know, when you're when you're doing some remodeling, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, too, about, you know, changing curb appeal and, and doing things to increase the value of the home. But, um, you know, one of the challenge I know we're saying, I know you're saying it too, is is just this challenge of communicating. And, you know, you can't do those in-home consultations as much anymore. And, and depending where you are, even less. <laughs> um, so how, how are you guys um, working around that? What kind of tools have you come up with? And, you know, what are the things that you're doing with as Thermatrue? Yeah, so, you know, the remodeling companies that we work with, um, we already had existing digital catalogs that were available. Um, now, what we are seeing is those companies are utilizing technology more. Um, they're doing, instead of those initial consultations in the home, they're having those virtually. Um, they're sending links to information um, that the customer can browse online, kind of do some selections, um, if you will, and narrow down their choices. Um, and then really until the um, selection and measure visit is needed, um, that's really the time that they would actually schedule something and be in person. Um, so we're definitely seeing people utilize that technology. And, um, you know, I think we've probably jumped forward a few years um, in technology in our industry just in this short period of time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, looking at your background right now, we, we were talking about, um, you know, how you guys created this virtual experience, which is which is huge right now. You know, the technology, you talk about the technology, you know, it's really changed how we've done it. And now we, you were getting more and more comfortable with doing face to face over, uh, you know, a camera like this. And um, so so talk about your virtual experience a little bit, because I think that's a great tool um, for for people to to dig in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can visit it through the thermatrue.com website. Um, it's actually on the home page. You're able to click through and and just put in, um, you know, an, an email address and some basic information. Um, it really is providing um, a broad experience um, that is introducing new products, really reframing our premium product, our classic craft doors. Um, really cool features in being able to change out some of the facades on the home um, from our five prime product and then swapping out the doors to give a look in uh, different styles of homes. So um, there's also a, a great amount of information, um, tools um, that can be used to help sell um, and then really some some information for training and things that you could come back to over and over. 
Right, right. It's really good. And I, I love the fact that, that you can do that. And it's interactive. Um, and that's, you know, that's the key right now. And as things start to open up, you know, you get that that uh, direct connection a little bit more and more. But this is this is such a good good thing for at least a baseline start. And you can have those conversations and it's a real unique way. So really, really great work there. I, I really love that. So, you know, the other thing that we're facing, obviously, are delivery times, um, you know, with material suppliers and, you know, things on down the line being being delayed. And how are you guys addressing those things? How are you handling that? And what's uh, what's your key on that? Yeah, I, I can't give enough credit to our team. Um, they are diligent um, every day looking for um, the ability to maximize capacity. Um, and balance that with the demand that we have. Um, they're they're looking at all options that are available. So, uh, one instance, um, one of the things that they did is we converted what was a steel door only production line, um, so that that line can now toggle between making fiberglass doors and steel doors. So they're looking at every option um, for what can immediately be done in the near term. And then, um, you know, our parent company, Fortune Brands, always supports the growth that we have. And so we always have the longer term plan for um, how we maximize production. But, you know, our plan is running six and a half days a week. Uh, that other half day is just for maintenance. And uh, so, so yeah, they're doing all that they can. Um, and I've been very impressed with, with what they've been able to do in juggling um, all the, the things they're looking at. Yeah, that's that's super. That is just uh, just a beast for us right now, all to tackle. And 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 it's not just you know, it's obviously not just ThermaTrue. It's everybody across the board that's facing this right now. And and so you know, keeping that communication alive is big for us. And 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 knowing you know, setting those expectations and and trying not to uh, try not to get too too aggressive on the expectations, but just be honest. Um, and I think yeah. I think a, that's that's appreciated. Um, so let's talk about trends a little bit. And, um, you know, the, the green, one thing maybe not related to COVID, but but really on everybody's mind um, is the green side of things and, and more efficiencies and things like that. And tell me some of the advances, some of the things that you've done to do to, to address those kind of things. Yeah, you know, so Thermatrue pioneered the fiberglass door years ago. Um, and so, you know, fiberglass doors have a higher R rating, um, which, you know, is is obviously uh, very appealing um, when it comes to the green message. Um, really, is that, that measure of insulation um, is drastically different in fiberglass doors than it is in wood doors. Um, so, you know, we were a little bit ahead of the curve, I think, from that standpoint, um, even before the green movement took on. Um, you know, Thermatru does take it a step further, though. Um, and so we go to market with a full door system approach, meaning that all of the doors, the glass, the components that go into the door unit, they are all engineered and manufactured to work together. Um, and really the meaning for that being, um, for a tighter seal, for less leakage, for better performance. All of those things are, um, you know, made to work together instead of one manufacturer making, um, you know, the the seals and, and someone else making the hinges, you know. So everything is, is made to work together. That just allows us to have a, a better performing door. Um, you know, the other thing is, um, so often it is um, kind of placed to the side that insulation is so important when it comes to efficiency. Um, and, you know, Thermatrue saw the need in making sure that doors are installed properly, um, creating that, that tight seal. Um, so we actually created a, a certified installer program um, that trains installers on the proper installation of Thermature doors. So um, there is a course that's available um, and, you know, through those courses, an installer can be certified and they can promote that, um, you know, for their business. And um, well, that just means to us that we know that more doors are being installed properly. 
Right, right. And I know Mole Millwork, um, who you know, is is a certified installer and yeah. and uh, that program's been very, very good for them for their installations. And I know they do a ton, ton yeah. of door installations. Um, and, and it's nice to have that factory backing behind that too. And when you do it consistently over time, you do things the right way. So that's that's a great program that you guys have. Um, you know, the other thing that um, we talked about a little bit was, um, you know, going into remodeling, you know, some of the trends we're seeing is is people are remodeling their space now. They're they're building their, you know, their castle. Their castle is their home and, and we're, we're stuck here. We want to do something different. Um, but there's an investment with that. And, you know, price always comes into it. And um, that's always the debate. You know, what do I want to spend on this? But I think you guys have some great statistics on what what the value is in doing an entry door and the curb appeal and things like that. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. Thermatru completed a proprietary study in 2017 um, and the the response, the research showed that um, a new Thermatru door can increase the home's perceived value by 4.2%. So on average, that is $18,750. Um, you know, when it comes to curb appeal, that front door is such an important part. And, you know, clearly you're not likely to have the cost, um, you know, be around that $18,000 range. So you're getting a great return on, on making a, a replacement in that area. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very important that and the perceived value being that, you know, anyone can drive by the home and that's what they think that that um, that value is so yeah yeah and i think i think you quote a stat um you know, we may show it here but um it's the um improving curb appeal is one of the top five most valuable upgrades you can make and that's from the national association of realtors so that you know it it seems like such a simple thing but um you know it's not always thought of as that impactful um you know you think about you know people doing drive-bys and you you drive by a property or everything's online now and you you see that first picture you see is of the front door and the front face of the house and it becomes so key to that so even as as we see the trends you know people remodeling and doing things in inside the home that's a great addition um, to it as well that that it's an investment for down the road when they are ready to sell, they are ready to change, um, whether it's upsizing or downsizing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's that's great. Andrea, this is great. Um, we've got some great information here and we'll share this uh, information uh, as well on the website. Um, so if people wanna go and see some of these statistics and um, talk about some of the things to, to homeowners that they're talking to along the way, you know, these are great selling points for just just doing the right things right now. So I appreciate your time. This has been this has been great, and uh, good luck to you moving forward with Thermatru. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, I'm here with Eric Mason, and he's the architectural marketing manager. Uh, excuse me. Let's let's try that again. All right. I'm here with Eric Mason now, and he is the architectural market manager for Marvin. And uh, Eric, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, Mark. Glad to help. It's great. So tell us a little bit about, about your background. Where do you come from? What's, what's your expertise? Well, Mark, I, uh, I, I grew up in Southern Iowa. So I was a son of a shop teacher. I always grew up working with my hands on, on summer projects when he was on a summer break. So just naturally took a, a liking to being involved in the trade and uh, moved into the contracting world as I got out of school. And then as time progressed, I went to work as a millwork sales rep, got involved with windows and doors and um, ended up working for Marvin. So I, I lived down in the Kansas City area in a little historic town called Liberty, Missouri, on the northeast side of the Kansas City metro area. And um, it's good for me because really my background is my passions are historic preservation. I'm really involved in, involved in historic work as long as uh, new construction builds that we do, uh, you know, supporting architects. So I kind of still get to get my hands dirty and, and get involved with some design elements and some construction elements, and yet uh, be able to go home at the end of the day and, and, and hang my hat. Yeah, that's it's great. And I know you you work with Kansas City Millwork and Mole Millwork quite extensively down there. In fact, you get a little history with Kansas City uh, Millwork. And uh, but uh, 
Uh, we appreciate all you do. And, and this would be a great conversation from a perspective of manufacturer and, and what Marvin is doing and, and what you're seeing. So so let's just jump right in and let's let's talk about some of the trends that we're seeing. You know, one one big thing, especially that we see with windows and doors is these these indoor outdoor spaces. And um, you know, let's let's just talk about that a little bit. What are you seeing that that's kind of evolved with that? Yeah, what we see with the design community really wanting their clients to be able to blur the lines from the inside and the outside. You know, these large scenic doors where you're, you're opening up a space, maybe it's an, right to a patio or a little nigh, um, and just being able to enjoy the outdoors, but yet not be in the outdoors. You know, maybe it's a screened in structure, um, you know, no lips or very low lips on the door. So you, you have a seamless transition uh, from the floor to your threshold or your door out to your deck or whatever that space is out there. So we do see a lot of that. Um, you know, here in the Midwest, people like their fresh air still, so it, it's nice to be able to maybe unwind or maybe you do a, a Zoom or a Teams meeting from your, your Lanai area out enjoying the breeze as the weather's warming up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and I guess it always changes. You know, the, it's a little more seasonal for um, the Midwest as it is in California, but, um, but you know, it, we're, we're seeing a lot of that too, and, and just... Um, it seems like, you know, obviously California and these warmer climates and maybe even Dallas a little bit, and except for the humidity maybe, but but they're used to opening these things up, right? But you're seeing more of that um, down in, in the Midwest? We are, you know, we've got some, uh, you know, it's these larger format doors with, with screen options too. And that's the biggest thing is, you know, being landlocked here in the Midwest, we might see a picture from house of this gorgeous West Coast house with, uh, you know, this ocean view, whereas we don't have that. But uh, apparently, we always joke, they don't have bugs out in the West Coast either. The bugs all stay here in the Midwest. So it's really important to be able to open up that space, but yet have a screen to keep those bugs out. We do get a fair amount of bugs. Yeah, yeah, those and the spaces are just uh, just beautiful now. And, you know, I've, and, and people, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, people being more confined now and, um, you know, some of these stay at home orders and no matter how you feel about that, you know, sometimes that's a real challenge for people. You know, you got the kids at home, you've got you at home, you're always at home. Um, so, you know, what's kind of happening with that? How is that changing the remodeling side uh, from your perspective? Well, we've also seen, you know, some of these uh, large scenic doors going in, but also maybe it's that um, when it comes to a remodel, there might be an addition. Maybe it's an outdoor studio that's not connected to the home. Um, you could see may maybe it's time to add that garage and then put a an office space or a workspace up above that or a meditation space, just some place to get that separation that maybe you typically got from going to work or from the kids got from going to school. You know, uh, we all love our families, those of us that have them, but, uh, you know, sometimes it can be really hard in the same room all the time. So just getting that separation and that uh, be able to focus on your work and get the task done on hand has is, is been top of mind with a lot of our, our conversations lately. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and and we're seeing that as well. And I think, you know, the other thing that, that um, we think about when we think about the trends that are happening now is is some of the the consciousness of the green and and, you know, maybe maybe it's not so much green as it is the efficiencies, you know, maybe it's both. Um, of course, California, you know, they've got some restrictions on that that um, you have to comply to. But the Midwest doesn't really have those. But, um, you know, we're, we're seeing some of that, too. So, you know, talk about some like the air quality issues and things that, that you've seen on that side of things. I do get to hear quite a bit about, uh, you know, homes are so much tighter nowadays. There, there's techniques uh, to open them up. The windows and doors are more high performance. Uh, you know, they're using items like uh, a closed cell insulation where, you're, you know, now you're putting an air exchanger in to help bring in some of that fresh air, whereas the old balloon framed homes that would, you know, quote unquote, breathe, um, you had a little bit a better air quality to them. Now, the dead of winter, those balloon frame homes get really dry because, you, you know, you're not, as, you're not holding humidity in that the, the mechanical system is creating. But, um, you know, you're seeing a lot more of that, uh, that conversation, and then you got to have the fresh air that gets introduced, you know, it seems like we still see a fair amount of people here that want to open their windows and bring in that fresh air where it allows. You know, you get a lot of cooler nights um, during the summer, even you can open up ventilate um, and then, you know, help control humidity. That's the biggest thing is keeping humidity down. But having that fresh air is, is still very important. Operating windows and doors that bring in fresh air is still always almost 90% of our conversations, somebody brings it Right, right. And we we had a conversation a couple of months ago with a builder in Colorado, uh, which is where I am. And, you know, he's he's building up in Castle Rock, which is, you know, we're you're up around 6,000 feet, six, 7,000 feet above sea level. 
And it, the first thought is, you know, they wanted to do an indoor outdoor space and they wanted to open it up. And he's like, you know, and, and he got a lot of feedback. Now you can't do that in Colorado. You can't, but you know, even here we get mild weather in the winter and, and certainly in the summer, there's good opportunities there too. So um, I, I think we're seeing that uh, in a lot of places um, as well, but um, it, one word that you and I talked about a minute ago was um, embodied energy. Um, talk about that and how, how is that impacted? What is Marvin, uh, how does Marvin play a role in that? Well, it does seem like, um, you know, when people start talking about a green building technique or being more environmentally friendly, um, the one thing that we discuss is the embodied energy with our fiberglass products. You know, you start comparing it to maybe a vinyl, which is a petroleum based product, you know, fiberglass comes from silica, basically it's a base component. So plenty of silica available, um, around the world. And it's a green building technique. I mean, it's it's you're creating you're forcing some products into a dye, creating exothermic heat, and then it's coming out a protruded piece of fiberglass. So we're not taking that out of a petroleum-based product. We're not um, shipping that on containers around the world to be recycled or, or remelted. And so it's it's a it's a very environmentally friendly way to build aluminum. If you think about fiberglass too, it's the same component as glass. So any of your expansion contraction rates are virtually identical. So we've really kind of engineered any any seal failures or issues you might have down the road. Especially with these bigger door openings that we're asking you to do nowadays, it's good to have a nice stable product that won't move in the uh, between the the hot and cold cycles in winter. Right, right, and that's you know that's that's great because you've got it from both sides of that too, right? You've got you've got the efficiency side from you know when it's installed and and when it's performing in the home, but you've also got it on the manufacturing side and and. Um, you've got those green aspects of um, that you just talked about of the fiberglass. So, so that's great. Um, you know, and and maybe the last thing, just just a little touch on, you know, we we talk about the oasis at home, right? We talk about um, you know people are remodeling, and and we're seeing a little bit of this shift um, where uh, they're not necessarily looking for a new home build. Now's the time to to just just stay at home. Let's let's do something with the home. And and we talked about that a little bit where. You know, it's it's the family all in one place. But, you know, in some cases, whether there's a stay at home order or just people are trying to confine a little bit more, stay a little bit tighter at home. You know, now you've got this space that you're staring at four walls constantly um, and, and they're kind of moving in that direction. What are you seeing on that? Well, we've seen plenty of um, maybe it's not a full blown remodel, but they need to add some structure because, uh, you know, that typical sliding patio door off the dining room that goes out to a deck. Maybe that's going to get taken out that six foot wide. And they're going to put in a 16 foot wide, eight foot tall door, you know, have a, a moving wall of glass now, whether it's a, a biparting fridge door or a multi slide door or a or a bifold door. So we see a lot more of that. Maybe they expand the deck, but then you've got all this glass that's letting in this light. You know, again, we're blurring that line between the inside and the outside. So um, that encompasses structure. So it's a remodel, and and we see um, we see a fair amount of that. Where you know, maybe in the past it might have been easier. To, you know what? Just pick up and move and find another home. It, it does seem like when when people decide to stay put or in their house a little bit longer, we start doing projects like that. So we we don't do the whole house. It's not a new build, but um, we might get a couple of doors out of it and, and a window or two. Right, right. Yeah, it's really good. There's, you know, a lot of changes um, and it's interesting to see. And we talked earlier about, you know, you know, going into 2020 and when things started locking down, you really started worrying about the economy and what was happening. But but last year was a strong year for the building building industry. And, you know, remodeling was a big part of that, I know. And um, so it's it's good to see things to continue and people are able to do these things and you know, this is this is a good focus for uh, for businesses that we're we're talking to. So, absolutely, yeah, it's great, great, Eric. Hey, I really appreciate the time. I um, I wish you luck, and it's great to work with you. And thanks for spending the time with with all of us here today. Thanks, talk. It's great to talk to you, Mark, and have a great day as well. All right, thanks. All right, I'm here with Rob Ross, and he's the principal for Trad Building Design out of uh, Boulder, Colorado, and. Uh, Welcome, Rod. Rob, it's great to have you with us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, great to be here. Glad to answer some questions. All right, good. Well, let's start off by uh, telling us a little bit about your background. Um, what do you do? Tell us a little bit about Trad Design and Build. Uh, yeah, so I'm our architect. My business partner is a general contractor. So we are a true like architect-owned residential design build firm in Boulder, Colorado. 
the bulk of our work is remodels and additions in the county that we do custom work as well both accessory dwelling units custom homes in and around boulder and boulder county and uh trad is five a little over five years old now but uh, collectively dan and i have both been working in the, the boulder area for oh since the, the mid early uh 2000s so 2006 7 um for dan i think 2001 for me so you know we've been doing a lot of work here on the front range and in our area for quite some time uh so a lot of a lot of homes have, have seen our <laughs> our influence and touch both as you know working independently and together so yeah that's great um so so boulder a kind of a unique um area for those who may not know boulders um, just west of denver basically and um is you know the, that whole area around boulder between boulder and denver has just grown and um, you know, a lot of a lot of things around uh, built around the 60s and 70s, the old the old by level and tri level that was so popular for so many years. And um, and so, you know, when we talk about trends in that area, that's that's something you've really worked with is taking those older designs and just giving them new life, giving them a, a contemporary feel. Um, and, and just talk about that a little bit about what you've done with that kind of market. Yeah, Boulder, like so many other cities around here, has such a, a large collection of, of housing stock from that that time frame and branches included. And uh, but the buy levels in particular are always uh, their own unique challenge to you know improve architecturally, make them unique, make them special. You know, take something that hundreds or thousands of them have been built and you know give them a new life and character moving forward. So uh, you know. They, you know, particularly poor entries, many other features, low ceilings and things like that, you know, are some of the baseline improvements. And then on the green building side, you know, having and doing work in Boulder and Boulder County, you know, we do have some of the, the more stringent, rigorous green building codes in the country. So even when you're tackling, you know, updating uh, something like a by level you know, the goal isn't only always to, you know, architecturally improve it and, and, you know, get something the client is excited to have in the end. A big part of that is, you know, what are we doing to improve, you know, the energy efficiency components to that and, you know, everything from, you know, windows and doors to mechanical systems. Right. And I know you get into the, the kitchens as well and, and some of the designs with that. And you have your own cabinet shop. And yeah. and it's it's just interesting. And some of the things we were talking about today is, um, you know, how um, the people are, are spending a lot more time in the homes. You know, they're moving in with um, their business, with, you know, doing business with home. You've got you've got kids in the home more often and and trying to spit out. And I got this spend some time with you last week on one of your projects and and really you know um, you guys did a great job just opening up um, some of that area um, which is you know some we're seeing um, it's coming more compartmentalized and where you know we want to we want to section off the um, the office space and give it some privacy but you open this one up a little bit and was that something um, that that you know that's kind of been a trend that's going along uh, around for a while do you see that changing or is that something you continue to move with yeah i mean there definitely is demand for more private space giving you know people and kids working from home and you know it's interesting a lot of our projects currently under construction were planned either before or early days of covid before you know some of that influence overly dictated uh, you know what we were doing in these homes you know uh, by levels in particular, ranches, you know, opening them up from some of that compartmentalized, you know, design that we saw, saw in a lot of these older homes, still is very popular. You know, low ceilings that are just under eight foot or at eight foot, kitchens that are yeah. closed off. You know, opening up those living spaces still is a very common trait, trend, and detail that, that we do for folks. You know, vaulting ceilings in them are, is a very popular thing that happens and really transforms those spaces, you know, but as far as dedicating, you know, quiet space, you know, that's varies client to client, but there's always, you know, that drive for the guest room slash home office that can be closed off or, or thinking through, you know, where somebody can work. We still do put in, 
you know, little cubbies or niches or dedicated workspaces on projects. You know, they're not always as private as maybe they would be now with so many people working from home. Uh, but, you know, it, it's not that uncommon uh, across different industries and tech industries where people do often work from home. So, you know, it, the home offices have, have been part of, you know, how somebody uses that space or a multi-use flex space. But, you know, recently we did a full interior remodel, lost a bedroom, you know, to kind of help rearrange and open up that space, but, you know, created an adjacent, you know, home office nook, if you will, to, you know, give them that, that space. Now it's not private and quiet in that solution, uh, right. but you know, we were kind of looking at that from a different perspective earlier on. So, you know, now we're, you know, in final, uh, final paint and things like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, moving forward, people have asked, inquired. Um, and I think a bigger challenge is, you know, people try to find solutions for working at home uh, with the constraints they have, but, you know, yeah. easier to think about. And then the reality of, you know, doing that much work to your house and disrupting it while you're still living in there has been a challenge too. Right, sure. Well, and, and you mentioned the green building and the codes in Boulder are, are generally more stringent and more more California like than yeah. maybe even like in a market like Denver but um you know and I guess you know one thing we talk about is is remodeling and how um you know there's a common thing to to scrape and rebuild and just and just start over but but you're taking the bones of the house and and so this is kind of an economy of efficiency that um, is that green building thing is, you know, you're, you're keeping intact the, the materials that are there, the baseline materials and building from that and turning it into something that's completely new. Um, you know, the, the home that, that I visited with you last week, it's, it's a bi-level and, you know, it was what, 60s, 70s, somewhere in that range. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was built. I remember the exact year. And um, so, you know, Really, that's a that's a green um, part of your your process right there, isn't it? Just starting with the initial structure. Absolutely, I think homeowners sometimes get a little bit of a mixed thought across the industry from whether their house should be torn all the way down and starting yeah. over or not. And you know, a lot of that is market and budget driven too. For you know, really sure. how much change you're doing to a home, but you know, what we're doing are often you know the pop top the new master suite on top or some additional square footage or space to, you know, add, add to those homes. And the bones are often, you know, adequate, you know, lumber and things that were built back then sometimes are, were, were better quality. They're great to work with. Um, what we do pull out, we, we recycle, but, you know, it, it's almost more interesting sometimes working with the constraints <laughs> It gives you a different, more fun design challenge, uh, you know, reaching towards what whatever that client's end goal is. You know, do they want something modern out of a buy level or are they, um, you know, looking to bring it more into something more of a traditional role, a farmhouse or, a, you know, a craftsman type thing. So, you know, taking a buy level, which is a pretty generic, you know, transitional builders <laughs> you know, floor plan and, you know, trying to apply some style and character to it, you know, it's a challenge. It's a fun design challenge. Um, and, you know, I think saving those structures, especially foundations, first floors, you know, we're often changing roof lines. So, you know, you might scrape a roof off, but there's still a fair amount of, of wood and products saved in that, that home. And as we've seen over the last year plus, I mean, even in the last few months alone, lumber pricing has skyrocketed. So, right. Right. You know, what we can leave in the house is that much less that we're having to replace, you know. And yeah. Build. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's and that's a big change we've seen this last year too. I guess with with COVID is the the pricing and availability lumber has just just been a, a real challenge. So that's a that's a great point that you mentioned there. You know, and the other thing um, is you consider some of these older homes and, um, you know, old windows and, and things and, and changing them. Like, you know, this home you just did was um, you, you put Marvin in there and, um, and I imagine, you know, some of the efficiencies are part of that, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, this home in particular had, I think the majority of the windows with the exception of a few and an addition it had had sometime in the last 25 years were still, single pane aluminum windows down in the basement, maybe some double pane vinyl or aluminum upstairs still is a bit of a hodgepodge. So, you know, sure. coming in with um, a full, you know, new window package 
you know, it's a big aesthetic improvement, but the energy improvements also uh, are great. You know, I'm one of my favorite window lines to use in sort of our, our market of remodels is that essentials line for, for Marvin, you know, the limitations aren't, aren't that bad. You know, I mean, you really can get a great combination of, of windows that can be molded together and, you know, get a great aesthetic and, you know, the U values that we're targeting now are, are getting more and more attainable with improved glass coatings and things like that, which isn't Marvin specific. That's really more glazing type. Right. Type. Right. But, you know, the fact that, you know, we can get these additional coatings, you know, at an additional cost, <laughs> you know, depending <laughs> on how it's driving the, the project and the green building requirements. Uh, right. But, you know, getting down to a, a 0.27, a 0.26 U value on, something which is just our baseline requirements now for anything that we're doing on a, a prescriptive path type review. You know, when you get into a performance yeah. path where an energy rating is involved, then that gives you a little bit more flexibility on, you know, one door can be over, it's more of a collective, you know, snapshot of the whole house. But a lot of times when it's a one and done, you know, we, we need those resources and, and Marvin and you know, some of the other folks that you guys work with or, you know, have products that can, can meet those low U value demands in the market now. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's something, obviously the trend continues to move more in that direction, um, you know, for, for the green aspect, but also the efficiency aspect and, and people appreciate that more and <laughs> being able to keep your heat and keep your cool in the home when it, where it's supposed to be, when you yeah. need it. So, right. It's so, next to the window on a cold day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, that's this is great, and I I I love how, how you guys approach the market and the things that you've done, and um, just uh, transitioning, um, you know, older homes and giving them new life. It's it's kind of a fun thing. So I really, really wanted to talk to you about that, and I appreciate you taking the time today to to go through that with me. Thanks, absolutely. Yeah, great. All right, have a have a great day. Cool. Thanks, Mark. All right, I'm going to have our, our panelists uh, unmute themselves. So um, Andrea and Eric, if you guys can unmute, uh, hopefully you can hear me OK. And Alex, um, we're going to come back to uh, questions. So um, some great discussions we had today. And before I get started in the questions, um, if, if you do have a question, we've got a few so far, but if you do have a question, uh, you can type it in the Q&A at the bottom right um, of your window. So, um, first of all, Dalila, you've got um, a webinar coming up next next month on something unique. I'll let you talk about that a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, we are going to be talking about accessory dwelling units and how it is a big building trend that just came about in 2020. Um, so, we're going to be talking about that. That's going to be in April the 20th at nine o'clock in the morning. And if you guys want to register for that, that is already up on the BMDUSA.com website. Looking forward to that. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dalila. So, so let's jump in, uh, Dalila. I know we've got some questions. I'll let you go ahead and uh, feed that and uh, see see what we can address here. Sure, great. Our first question uh, for all the panelists: we have, In your opinion, what is the number one remodeling request you are seeing? <laughs> Anyone want to take that over? <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, hopefully you can hear me well, but uh, just as I talked about, it, it's the large doors. Uh, that's still the, the biggest trend that we see as far as when we're invited to a, uh, a discussion on a remodeling project is making the space seem bigger. The existing space, you can make it bigger with more glass. That's yeah, awesome that's that's really good. Those indoor outdoor spaces and those large doors, yeah, that's that's a lot of what we're seeing. So, you know, I'm I'm spent a lot of time in the Midwest here. Um obviously Eric, you're in the Midwest and Delila, you're in California, Alex you're in California. But you know, the the trend in California, we've seen those those big open doors and you know, get that indoor outdoor space and it's really moving um to the Midwest. Um, you know, the the weather we can have some mild weather when, when the months are right. So it's it is moving that way too. So that's a great point, Eric. Yep. Yeah, to add Eric's point, a lot of the indoor and outdoor kitchens, people just utilizing their existing space. Um, a, a term that I saw coined by Pinterest was office. People converting their closets into office because we're limited in California. So um, I thought that was kind of interesting, emerging trend. Nice. 
That's yeah, and we're there. seeing the same. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing. Um, really an expansion into the outdoor space and um, doors and products that allow to do that. And then really actually taking that a step further. And um, we're seeing a lot of composite decking type projects that are being added to the outdoor space, really just expanding that living area. Very good. All right. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, we do have a couple more questions. What platforms are you are you guys seeing when doing virtual constant consultations? How do you how is um, you know with COVID? How has uh, doing the virtual consultations? What are you guys using to do those? For me, it's been a, a about a 50 50 mix of Zoom and Teams. Those have been the predominant ones. Same for me as well. I try to just be flexible, whatever people are more comfortable using. If they would like me to set it up, we use Microsoft Teams, but if a client is more comfortable with Zoom, whatever works best for them. Sure. Same here. Yeah, it's great. Things have gotten a little bit easier. People are getting a little more familiar with things, but but yeah, at least the uh, uh, user friendliness of these platforms getting better and better as we go. Yes. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Um, and another question coming in, what type of remodeling uh, tends to yield the highest return of investment? I mean, I still, you know, it, it's always been kitchens and baths are where you get your most money. And I, I continue to hear that, you know, we're still expanding those big kitchens and or, or doing the outdoor kitchens. So, um, of course, I don't track the industry as a whole, but usually that's that's the tidbits that I hear. I'm sitting down with someone. Yeah, and I guess I personally spent a lot of time in the kitchen, so I definitely understand <laughs> the the request for a lot of kitchen and living area remodels. Well, and I came across an interesting stat as we were getting ready for this. And uh, House did a study that two in five homeowners, which is 40, 41 percent, who renovated their master bathroom say they rely on their new space for rest and relaxation so they're creating this oasis to get away from everything so you know that that doesn't really speak to the um uh you know the roi on that but that that kind of says what what people are doing right and bathrooms and and kitchens are big but you know andrea we talked about the the door increasing the value of the home um you had some pretty good stats on that too yeah, absolutely. That curb appeal investment seems to be, um, you know, a big return for folks. And that can be anything from the exterior cladding um, all the way to the entry door and, and even landscape. Hey, Dalila, I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah, we got one more. Um, so in your guys' opinion, is the trend of open floor plans reversing at all? I think it's being reconsidered, right? I mean, we now need home office space. You're crying four-year-old who's paying attention in the middle of a webinar. It's probably not the most ideal situation. So I think people are definitely reconsidering. Yes, I would agree with that. We're, we are seeing that, um, yeah, especially in the commercial spaces, you'd see that open collaborative feel, but the residentially, um, there is a, a desire to find a way to shut off uh, the elements if you can. This was this has been great. I appreciate all the panelists' time. Um, I think we had some some great information here, and we'll make this information on uh, available on the website. We'll have the uh, the webinar recorded there, so you can view it um, later on or pass it on if you have somebody that might be interested. But thank you all uh, to, for joining us. It was a uh, it was a nice time well spent. Thank you for having us. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, thanks.